Welcome to class, everyone. Thank you, online students and uh, e-learning students and in-person students for joining us this morning. Are you all excited to study about the kingdom of God? Yes, okay. So there are some powerful truths that we will learn today. I'm just uh, praying that these uh, truths um, will give you a fresh new perspective about the kingdom, about how you can minister in this kingdom, even as you are called and to be part of this kingdom, and you've been given the keys of authority and also given the mandate to extend this kingdom here on earth. Okay. So I'm excited to teach this class, and I hope all of you are excited as well. And um, we'll begin with a prayer, uh, with a word of prayer. So can uh, Sugat, can you lead us in prayer, please? Thank you, Father. Thank you for this wonderful day, wonderful time in my life. God, thank you for this opportunity, Father, uh, today, this class, God, uh, give a good wisdom, good knowledge, and Father, Thank you. Uh, thank you this uh, opportunity. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. So the last, uh, we are looking at uh, chapter 2 today. We looked at chapter 1 and the introduction in chapter 1 uh, last week. We'll begin studying chapter 2 uh, from your textbook, The Kingdom of God. So in the last class, we began talking about the kingdom of God. We discovered that God's original intent was, what was God's original intent? What was God's original plan or intent or his desire? Hello, last class. The whole time we were talking about that. What was God's original plan or intent? And we saw that in Genesis 1 as well. Sister, to dwell with human beings. Okay. To, man, to dwell with context, mankind. Yes. In this context, we are studying what was God's original plan or intent. To rule and reign over the world. It was God's intent to establish a kingdom, right? To establish a kingdom of whom? Kingdom of? Hello, please read all your notes when you come. Please take notes in class. Please read and come to class so that it will be helpful. Yes, thank you, Komal, right? This one student at least to establish a kingdom of people. That is what I was telling the whole two hours last week. His original plan, his original intent was to establish a kingdom of people who would be co heirs with Jesus Christ, heirs of God, co heirs with Jesus Christ in the kingdom. What does that mean? It means that God wants you and I to inherit this kingdom and to rule along with him in his kingdom. Okay. We also looked at how God introduced the kingdom. Where did he introduce the kingdom? After he came here, when Jesus was born here on this earth, when did God introduce the kingdom on the earth? When did God introduce the kingdom? Oh, this is very sad. Huh? Yes, it's okay. It doesn't matter even if it's wrong. Even before the foundation of the world, yes, he had the plan that he has to make a kingdom, establish a kingdom of people. But when did God introduce or establish the kingdom? Of course, he through introduced John, the kingdom in... Through John the Baptist, sister. Okay, Jesus came introducing the kingdom. John the Baptist also introduced the kingdom. They initiated the kingdom. But when did God introduce the kingdom here on earth? The Garden of Eden, Eden right? I looked at Genesis. Genesis 1. If you look at your notes, yes or no? Now you're saying yes. See, the kingdom that was prepared and then we looked at... Um, Kingdom introduced. When did God introduce the kingdom? Genesis chapter 1, verses 27 and 28. Okay. And uh, yeah, Genesis chapter 1, verse 20, 
27 and 28. Okay. But we saw that when God introduced his kingdom here on earth, in Genesis, when he gave over the dominion of the earth to Adam and Eve, okay, um, was the, did, they, did they keep the kingdom or did they lose the kingdom authority? They lost they the lost kingdom us. authority. Yes, they lost the kingdom authority. They gave it to Satan. Yes. Mm -hmm. Then uh, we see how through Jesus, the kingdom of God was reintroduced, right? And how you and I have been in, uh, invited to inherit that kingdom. So the kingdom of God was introduced in the Garden of Eden. And when was the kingdom of God reintroduced? When Christ came. Yes, when Jesus came and he spoke and he thought about the kingdom of God. And we are invited to inherit that kingdom. We are, uh, look at the words I'm saying. We are invited to not be part of the kingdom. They're invited to, invited to inherit the kingdom. Mm -hmm. What is the meaning of inherit and what is the meaning of being part of the kingdom? When you say inherit the kingdom, what does it mean? When you say being part of the kingdom, what does it mean? Inherit. Yes, go ahead, Kofi. Inherit is you owning it. It becoming yours. Amen. And yes. then being part is sharing. Okay. Being part is uh, sharing. Okay. Yes. Inherit means uh, uh, you have the authority. Okay. Or, or over in the kingdom. You have authority. You're not just a part of uh, the kingdom. Okay. You share in the rule and reign of the kingdom. Okay. You share in the rule and reign. You inherit means uh, you own it. You're not part of it means, okay, you know, I'm just part of APC. So when I feel like serving, I'll serve. When I don't feel like serving, I don't serve. When people don't treat me nicely, <laughs> I will not come in. So when people acknowledge me, I will serve. So it's, it's when you're part of it, you, you take things very casually, very lightly. There's no responsibility. There's no ownership. There's nothing that you want to have to do. But here, God just did not call us to be part of his kingdom where he's doing everything and we are just being part of it, but he's called us to inherit that kingdom. Amen? Yes? So you and I are inheritors of the kingdom. Who inherits the father's property? The sons and the daughters, they inherit. That means they take ownership, they rule, they exercise their authority, they make it, um, they advance it, they extend the kingdom. Okay? So today we look at the king and his kingdom. And we'll focus on God as the king. And then look at how Jesus introduced that kingdom here on the earth. What method did he use when he introduced the kingdom here on the earth? And then we look at the relationship um, the church has with the kingdom. If you have time, we'll move on to chapter 3. Okay. So who is the king of the kingdom? God. Okay. He's the king of the kingdom. And um, when we look at God, we perceive God in many different ways. Yes or no? How do you perceive God? When you think of God, what do you think about him? Who is God to you? He's a king to you. Huh? He's your master, okay? Who is God to you? He's your father, yes, he's my father. Friend, yes. What else? He's a healer, deliverer, yes. So we, in many different ways we perceive God. But what does the Bible also teach us and bring to our attention is that God is king. Yes, he is savior. He is ruler. He is one in authority. He is our father. He is our friend. Um, but also the Bible establishes or teaches us and brings our attention to the fact that God is king. And why are we studying this in the kingdom of God? Why are we studying God as king? Why are we studying God as king? Come on. Simple. Huh? Okay, he created heaven and earth. Okay. Why is it important to know who is in charge of the place? Okay, we are going to inherit the kingdom. 
So we need to know who's a ruler, who's in authority, yes? And what happens when we know who's a ruler and who's the authority? You have to speak loud, I can't hear. Okay, we exalt praise and worship. Why is it important for us to know that God is king? To change your eye. You change your attitude, yes. So your attitude, how you relate to Abhinas in the Bible college is very different from how you relate to uh, Pastor Jakes or Pastor Ashish, right? Yes or no? How do you relate to Pastor Ashish? You won't relate to him like you relate to Abhinas or even to me or to Pastor Jakes. You relate to them, Pastor Ashish, in a very different way. Why? Because he's the person in charge, right, over the in this place. So there's a very different way you relate. So we learn, why are we learning that God is king? Because we learn to relate to this king who is a ruler, who is a lord over everything, okay? Online students with me, I can't uh, get any of your responses in the, in the chat section, okay? Uh, let's look at uh, Psalms chapter 145. David shares some facets of his understanding of God as king. So we'll... Uh, we look at David and what he understands about God as king. So please, can somebody read Psalm 145, verse 1, and verses 10 to 13. Psalm 145, verse 1, and verses 10 to 13. Psalm 145, uh, verse 1, 10 to 13. I will extol you, my God, O king, and I will bless your name forever and ever. Yeah, we'll just pause there. So the psalmist is saying... God, you are king. So because you are king, what am I going to do? I will bless your name. I will extol, extol you. What's the meaning of extol? Exalt, praise, worship, you know. Uh, so he's saying, I will worship you. I will extol you as king. So he's worshiping God as king. Okay. Okay. 10 to 13. All your works shall praise you, O Lord, and your saints shall bless you. They shall speak of the glory of your kingdom and talk of your power to make known to the sons of men his mighty acts and the glorious majesty of his kingdom. Your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom and your dominion endures throughout all generations. Amen. So here the psalmist is worshipping God as? How is he worshipping God? as king and then he's saying god your people they're going to talk about the glory of your kingdom and how great is your kingdom okay and how great is your power so even as we praise and worship you god your people are going to glorify your kingdom they're going to talk about how great is your kingdom okay and they will affirm that your kingdom is what kind of a kingdom everlasting kingdom unending your dominion endures through all generations okay so here when we read this we need to know that even as we are inherited the kingdom of god that god is king and we need to recognize him as king and even as we recognize him as kim king how should we relate to him we need to what does this verse say we need to exalt him we need to worship him as king okay um look at psalm chapter 47 verses 6 and 7 can somebody read that please psalm 47 verses 6 and uh, 7 anyone is open to it in the bible the psalmist says, sing praises to God, sing praises to our king, sing praises. For God is king of all the earth, sing praises with understanding. So when you come to worship God, he's saying, you can do it this way. How can you do it? How do you worship God? Sing praises to him. And when you sing praises, how should you sing? With understanding. Okay. So... How can you do it as you sing praises to the king? You know, how about when we sing, we sing with this heart attitude that's saying, God, you are king. 
and I'm singing praises to the king. This is my offering. This is my tribute. Um, and this is a way I'm exalting you and acknowledging you as king over my life. Amen. So how can you sing praises to this king? You're basically saying, God, I'm, when I'm singing, I'm singing with this heart attitude, saying, God, you are king, and I'm singing praises to the king. This is my tribute. This is my offering. You know, this is a way I'm exalting you and acknowledging you as king over my life. Okay? So even in our prayers, we can recognize God as king, right? Not only when we worship him, even when we pray, we can recognize God as king. So if you've opened to Psalms chapter 44, can somebody uh, read verse 4, please? You are my king, O God. So he's saying, the psalmist is saying, you are my king, O God. So he's saying, God, I recognize you as my king. Okay. So in the light of the fact that you are king, here is what I want you to do. So can you continue reading that? Psalm 44, verse 5. Through you we push back our enemies. Through your name we trample our foes. I do not trust in my bow. My sword does not bring my victory. But you give us victory over our enemies. You put our adversaries to shame. In God, we make our boast all day long, and we will praise your name forever. But now... Okay. So here in Psalms chapter 44, um, verse 4, it says, You are my king, O God. And then what, what else is the psalmist saying? Verse 4. Command victories for Jacob. Yes, he's saying command victories for... Jacob. Isn't that amazing? You know, the psalmist is saying, you are king, O God. You are king not over of my life. You are king over Jacob. You are king over Israel. And because you are king, what should you do? You should command victories for, for Jacob. You should command victories for Israel. So the psalmist is saying, in the light of the fact that I, we acknowledge you as king, as, even as I acknowledge you as king, God here, this is what I want you to do. I want you to issue and decree, command victories for Israel and for Jacob. Okay. So he's saying issue commands or issue decrees for what? For victory, yes. The word victory in Hebrew simply is the same word. The Hebrew word used for victory is the same word used for salvation. Okay. And the Hebrew word for salvation is the, the same word for victory as well. And it's a, an all-inclusive word. Okay. And it's the same word, the Hebrew word is for Yeshua. And what is the meaning of Yeshua? Jesus. Yes. Which means the name Jesus. So the name Yeshua in Hebrew is the name Jesus and is derived from the Hebrew word Yeshua, Yehoshua. Okay, Yehoshua. And what is the meaning of Yehoshua? Yahweh is salvation. Okay, Yahweh is salvation or it also means the Lord saves. Okay, and the Hebrew Yah is a short form for God's name. Okay. So Yahweh and Yasha means to save, to deliver. Therefore, Yeshua, Yeshua directly relates to the idea of God's salvation or deliverance. Okay, all of you with me? Yes. So the word victory is the same, has the same root word for Yeshua, okay, which means Jesus. And uh, it's derived from the Hebrew word Yehoshua, which means Yahweh is salvation, or it means the Lord saves. Okay, so Yahweh and Yash means to save, to deliver. Therefore, the word Yeshua basically relates to this idea of God as God's salvation or deliverance. Okay, so this whole understanding of salvation means deliverance, to save, to um, deliver. 
and we get the same root word for the word victory from this word, okay? So when we talk about salvation, it also means it's a very comprehensive word. It's a very pregnant word. Pregnant means it's full of meaning. It means prosperity, healing, deliverance, well-being. And so what um, um, the psalmist is saying here in verse 4 is he's saying, God, I want you to decree or command victory for Israel. That means he's saying, what is he saying when he's saying, I want to command victory? Is it just victory over their enemies? What is the meaning of victory? I just now said, what's the meaning of victory? Salvation, okay. What does salvation mean? Huh? The Lord saves, okay. What is the meaning of salvation? As I said, it's a very pregnant word. It's a whole, very comprehensive word. What is the meaning of salvation? So, so. Ah, what is the meaning of salvation? So, so. Ah, what is the lots of meaning? Healing, deliverance, huh? total well-being, prosperity. Okay. Hey, guys, wake up, everyone. It's morning. Okay. So it's healing, deliverance, prosperity, well-being. And so when he's saying, God, I want you to command victories for Israel, he's saying, God, I want you to command healing, deliverance, prosperity, um, uh, protection, well-being for the people of Israel. Amen? And why is he saying you should do this? Because he is king, right? Because he is king and because you are king, I want you to command victories. So how about when you and I pray, we pray in the light of this fact that God is king and you go to God and say, God, I like you, I would want you to command and decree victory in my life. Victory means deliverance, prosperity, well-being, wholeness, healing, salvation, whether it's your marriage, whether it's your finances, whether it is your mind, whether it's your business, whether it's your family, your children, you know, your um, career, your job, whatever it is, you can say, God, I want you to issue decrees or issue decrees or command of victory over healing over my life. I wanted to issue decree of deliverance over my life. I wanted to issue decree of uh, prosperity in my life. I wanted to issue decree of, uh, uh, you know, uh, protection from the enemy. So you need to command and uh, those victories over my life because you are king. So you can tell God this. You can tell God you are king and I want you to decree or command your victories over my life. And so when you speak this, it will be done, okay? Why? Because God is king, okay? And no questions asked, he will do it. Amen? Isn't this a powerful thought? Yes or no? All of you awake? Yes? Okay? So it's so powerful, right, that we can ask God to issue or command decrees and victory over areas in your life where you are seeing, you know, things not moving, things dead, you know, um, whether it's in your spiritual life, whether your finances, your job, whatever, you can say, God, you are king over my life. I wanted to issue a command decree over my healing over my marriage or healing over my body or issue decree of deliverance, whatever it is. So that is why it is important for us to have an understanding about God as king, okay? So when we have an understanding of God as king, it can not only affect the way we worship and praise God, but it also affects the way we pray to God. Yes or no? When we know when we go to a king and we ask him, you know, or we tell him something, we know that it is done because he's supreme authority, supreme power. There's nothing that he cannot do, right? So saying, God, if you command it, I know it will be done because you are the omnipotent ruler and uh, you are the ruler of this entire world, okay? So we look at some more insights of God as king, and um, some of them would be very obvious, but just a reminder about looking to God as king uh, and, you know, as one who is the king of this kingdom that we have inherited, okay? Are you all ready? Yes, the first one is uh, God 
God as king, he is the final authority. Okay. Authority is inherent in who he is. Okay. Nobody votes God into power and nobody votes him out of power. Amen. If you like God as king, good. If you don't like God as king, it's too bad. There's nothing that you can do. He will still be king. And your opinion cannot change the fact that he is king. Amen? So his authority is inherent, uh, inherent in himself. He does not derive his authority from anyone else. He is the final authority. Okay? So secondly, as king... God's word is also his command, okay? It is his law in his kingdom. When God says something, there are no debates about it. Nobody can argue against this. There's nobody voting whether we should agree to it, whether it should become a law or not. His word is his command. It is law. Amen. Period. Full stop. Okay? Thirdly, God as king, his presence is also the place of all his authority and his glory, right? So when you enter the presence of the king, you are entering into the presence of his complete glory and authority, okay? Now let's try relating this to something we experience in our everyday uh, uh, normal lives, okay? When you're meeting your, a friend of yours, how do you go? You, very casual, right? You're very casual. You know, you just say, hey, hi, man. Hi, dude. What, bro? You know, just sit down, talk. How's life? You catch up. You sit and talk. Not worrying about anything. Okay? But if you are in a meeting with a president of your organization, what happens? <laughs> no, heartbeat. <laughs> your heartbeat increases. Okay? There's no casual, casual behavior, very formal, right? You set your casual attitude aside and you behave in a very dignified way because you're entering the presence of somebody who's the president, somebody who represents authority and who somebody who, you know, is carrying the weight of that organization. Now, imagine you enter the presence, uh, presence of the president or the prime minister of this nation. Then what happens? becomes even more weightier, right? You kind of wear the best clothes because you're entering into the presence of a dignitary, okay? And his presence represents all the authority that is behind him or backing him. Now scale it up infinite times. You're scaling it up infinite times. When you enter the presence of the Almighty God, what is your attitude? No, I'm just asking you, when you enter the presence of the Almighty God, when you come to church, or when you're going for supernatural, when you're going for worship, when you're going for prayer. <laughs> Sorry, John Blessy says, lion becomes cat. <laughs> oh, that was a good one. Crack me up. Okay, anyway, thank you for that. So imagine infinite times, you, you know, scale it up. You're entering the presence of God. How is your attitude when you enter the presence of God who is king of all the earth? You really are humble? Are you really surrendered when you enter church? Right? How do you really uh, uh, enter church? What is your attitude? You know, sometimes you feel, hey, I'm so tired. You know, I don't feel like standing and worshipping. You know? Or we just come with a casual attitude, right? Some of us walk in so late. It's okay. Some of us carry our mobiles, not our Bibles to church. And if the mobile rings, we go out. Oh. Uh, we answer the phone. But so important for us to know where we have come. We have come to the presence of the king of kings. How will you behave when you have a big, the prime minister is there? Imagine the Prime Minister standing there on Sunday. All of you will be seated, well, come well before time, you know, dressed up well, smartly dressed, you know, and in your best behavior, right? So that is how we need to have our attitude 
when we come for fasting prayer, when you come for prayer, when you come for supernatural, come for morning worship, when we come for go to Sunday worship services, very, very important. You know, I've seen that attitude in my father. My father prepares to go for Sunday worship service from Saturday evening itself. Now, because he's 80 plus, he's become very slow. He will start from Saturday evening. He'll keep everything ready. He'll be ready. And he wants me to take him on time to church. And he would have gone dressed up like as if to say he's going to meet a dignitary or a prime minister. Right? That much of an attitude of that reverence and all he has towards God. When I see that, I think I have you know, zilch or very little of that attitude. So now, when I have prepared this, you know, I am reminded of this fact that, hey, what is my attitude when I go to Sunday worship, right? Sometimes we can say, hey, I have to just go because I have to serve in church, right? I'm rostered. I have to serve. I'm so tired. I wish I can stay back home, just worship online. But what is our attitude is very, very um, important, okay? Because we are entering the presence of the one who is the king of kings, the lord of lords, the king over all the earth. And his presence is authority. Where his presence is, there is glory. His glory is represented there. And you and I have the privilege. Imagine you and I have the privilege of entering the presence of this holy, awesome, mighty king of kings and also experiencing his presence. Okay. Number four, as king, God's name represents the full weight of his authority. Now, when you mention the name of somebody who's achieved a lot, we immediately respond to that name because we know that name carries weight and authority, right? So, for example, if Abinas tells you something, then you, you know, makes an announcement and you don't agree to that, you go back to him and you say, hey, Abinas, why like this? Then he says, Pastor Ashish said, everything comes to a full stop. No argument, no dissent. Because Pastor Ashish is the one in authority. He, you know, carries a weight and the authority. He said it. So his name carries his authority. We do what he says. Okay. So also the name of God as king. Okay. So when God has commanded things or said things in his word, his word carries authority. His word carries power. He's a God who fulfills it. And that is why it's important for us to speak God's word over our life or speak God's promises over our life. Amen. The fifth one, as king, God's command is an expression of who he is. Okay. You can follow through in your books. Okay. Uh, which page are we in? 15. Okay. So as king, God's command is an expression of of who he is. So whatever happens in his kingdom is very, very important for God because he is king. He does not treat it lightly when things happen in his kingdom. God desires. Why doesn't God treat things lightly when things are not going right in his kingdom? Why? Why doesn't God treat things lightly when things go wrong in his kingdom? Why? Why doesn't God like it when his when things are not going rightly in his kingdom? Yeah, Lucy says because he's a righteous and a just God, yes. Because his kingdom, because his kingdom is a true representation of who he is. When you look at an organization. You know, the organization reflects the leadership, right? When you look at the kingdom, the kingdom reflects the king. So when you look at God's kingdom, God's kingdom reflects who he is as king. So his kingdom is a true representation of who he is as king. So he does not take anything very lightly when things go wrong in his kingdom because his kingdom is a representation of his nature, his attributes, and who he is. Okay? Now, what do we know about God as king? Okay. What are the facets of God as a king? What do we mean when we say facets? It's basically what are the aspects? What are the attributes? What are the features? What are the parts of God as king? 
uh, we look at a very familiar scripture verse, which we will learn from uh, the different facets of or different features or parts of God's kingdom. It's something that we read during Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6 and 7. It's something that we read during Christmas time, Christmas season. So can somebody quickly read Isaiah chapter 9, verses 6 and 7, please? For uh, Isaiah 9, 6 and 7. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulder, and his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. Upon the throne of David and over his kingdom, to order it and establish it with judgment and justice, from that time forward, even forever, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. Amen. So here is a description of the king who's carrying on his shoulders the weight of his kingdom. What do we mean carrying on his shoulders? Yes, carrying on his shoulder means the responsibility the that he has. He's carrying, mm -hmm. he's carrying on his shoulder the weight of his kingdom or his government. And his kingdom is what kind of a kingdom? Everlasting kingdom. His kingdom will always continue to grow, will always continue to expand. There will be no end to his kingdom. Amen. But what kind of king is there at the center of this government? What kind of king is there at the center of this government? What do we learn from, uh, uh, from Isaiah chapter 9 verses 6 and 7? What kind of king is he? He is a wonderful counselor, mighty God, everlasting father, prince of peace. Now, what is the meaning of this word wonderful? It means miraculous. The word wonderful means miraculous. That means the king of this kingdom wants his kingdom to be saturated with the miraculous. Amen? A miracles are surprise gifts from God. And that is what he wants his kingdom to be full of. Aren't you excited about that? So you can say, God, since your kingdom is wonderful, it means uh, it's miraculous. You want your kingdom to be full, saturated, not full, just saturated with the miraculous. So I also, as an inheritor of your kingdom, I want to, you know, do signs, miracles and wonder so it's it's okay to pray like that why because you're praying in accordance to god's word right that is why we are looking at why is it important for us to study god as king of his kingdom okay so he wants his kingdom to be full of the miraculous so you're ready to to see your lives as full of miracles the kingdom of god is full of miracles okay and his name is also Counselor. Counselor means somebody who's an advisor, the wise one. Okay. I don't think it's in your notes. So you can please write down all of these things. Most of what I'm saying is not in your notes. So please take time to write it. Okay. So as a counselor, his name is his advisor and the wise one, which means he wants his kingdom to be filled with what? Wisdom. Yes, he wants his people to be walking in the wisdom of God. So how can you pray? Along these lines. How can you pray along these lines? Hello, how can you pray along these lines? Sister, we can pray for God to give us wisdom and understanding. Yes. Can you take the mic? You want to say something, Diksha? Quickly, quickly. We can pray like God, you are the counselor, you give us advice in our, in our life. Okay. You can say, God, you are the counselor and because you're the counselor, you are the wise one, you're the advisor. And because you want your kingdom to be filled with wisdom. So I, as somebody who's inherited your kingdom, I want to be walking in the wisdom of God. Amen. Okay. That is how you can pray. The next one. What's the next name? Mighty God. As mighty God, 
He is a God of power. He is the omnipotent one. Okay? Nothing can obstruct his plans, his purposes, and what he wants to fulfill. There's no power on earth that will stop it. Okay? So how can you pray according in these lines? How can you pray on, on these lines as mighty God? I'm teaching you how to pray. <laughs> huh? You can go boldly. Yeah, but how can you pray? What, you, what can you say based on what we talked about mighty God? Huh? He does mighty things. They're saying we can say, God, you are the mighty God, which means you are the omnipotent one. You are all powerful. No one can stop your plans in my life. So your plan in my life is for me to receive healing and nobody can stop that. And I receive that by faith. Or your plan is that I should have a, a future that is filled with hope, um, uh, a blessed future. Okay. And I believe that and I speak it because you are king and I want you to command that victory over my life. God, as a king and as an inheritor of your kingdom, you know, you want me to be the head and not the tail. So I want to be excellent in my workplace. I want to excel. I want my business to grow so that you can receive all the glory. I can extend your kingdom. And you are mighty God. You are the omnipotent one. And nothing can on earth can stop your plan of making me the head and not the tail of me be blessed, my, my basket being full, overflowing. So that is how you worship and that is how you pray. So, you know, so important to know God as king. So when you know God as king, this is how you pray. So when you pray all of this, God is not going to say, hey, you know, you're, <laughs> you're speaking in such boldness and all of those things. No, he's going to be pleased. Because his sons and daughters have understood him as king and they are asking him and God is more than pleased to do it. Amen? Amen? I okay, can't hear any amen from our online students. Okay. Amen. <laughs> Thank you, Lucy. So he's mighty God. And um, so be it, let him be the mighty God throughout his kingdom. Let him do mighty works. The next one is he's the everlasting Father. And as the everlasting Father, He's a Father who is compassionate, who cares about us. Um, you know, um, uh, huh? He protects us, loves us, blesses us. He's a Father to the needy, Father to the poor, Father to the oppressed. He's willing to step into our troubles. He's willing to come and encourage us. So you can say, God, you are my Father, be a Father too me. I'm opening my heart for you to experience you as my father. And I'm willing to allow you to step into my troubles. God, I feel oppressed. I feel, uh, you know, poor. I feel uh, needy. God, you are my father and hence I will lack no good thing. Amen. So all of your prayers are going to be powerful after this class. The last one, Prince of Peace. What is the word, Hebrew word for peace? Shalom. Shalom is also a very fully comprehensive word. It just doesn't mean peace. It also means total well-being. Yes. So he is a king who enforces wholeness throughout his kingdom. Amen. So if you don't see wholeness in your life, you don't see wholeness in your marriage, you don't see wholeness in your in your career, you don't see wholeness in your business or your job, you don't see wholeness in in your relationships or in your in your body, you can speak wholeness in the mighty name of Jesus because he is the king who enforces wholeness throughout his kingdom. Amen? Amen? Yes. What is the meaning of enforces? Basically implements. Basically one who imposes, brings about, put into full force. Okay? So he brings wholeness and peace into every one of his people's lives because he is shalom. So if some of you are not experiencing peace in your life, in your marriage, in your family, in your relationships, you can say, God, you are the prince of peace. 
and you enforce your wholeness, bring about wholeness and peace into every aspect of my life. Amen. So we can pray like this. Okay. And the king of um, uh, desires his kingdom to be an expression of himself. Okay. So we, we see in verse 7 that his judgment and justice will be throughout his kingdom. That means when he rules, he will rule with justice. He will rule with righteousness. Okay. Now, when we uh, think about the kingdom of God or when we talk about the kingdom of God, sometimes we emphasize just one aspect of the nature of God. We can either emphasize the aspect of God as somebody who's wonderful, somebody who does the miraculous, or we can emphasize the aspect of God as father, or we can, uh, you know, that is wonderful that he's our father who cares and loves for us, or he's the fatherhood of God. And uh, sometimes we emphasize that he is peace, okay, the, the, the prince of peace. All that is wonderful. But what it is important for us to do is that we don't just emphasize one aspect of God as king, but we emphasize all of his aspects, all of the facets of who he is. When we relate to him, we relate to him in all of who he is. Okay, that is very, very important. Why is it important for us to know God as king? Why is it important for us to relate to him with all of his aspects? Is because only then you can represent God for all who he is. Otherwise, you will represent only one facet of who he is and that can become, a, uh, can become dangerous. That will ultimately misrepresent him. So for example, you know, people come to God only when they want answers to prayer. Or they only come to God when they want the miraculous. Or they only want come to God when they want peace. He's also the counselor. He's also the everlasting father. He's also the mighty God. So all of these aspects are also there. So God wants his kingdom to be a full expression of himself. So it's important for us as people in his kingdom who's inherited his kingdom that we also understand all of his facets and we represent him in all of his uh, facets because he wants himself to be fully expressed. Okay, Only when we know all of who God is, we can fully represent him, we can teach him fully to others. Amen? Okay, the sixth one. God as king is, is to be feared and honored. Can somebody read Jeremiah chapter 10, verse 7, please? Jeremiah chapter 10, verse 7. Can somebody read that? Who would not fear you, O king of the nations? For this is your rightful due for among all the wise men of the nations and in all their kingdoms, there is none like you. Uh, read verse 10 also. Remind. But the Lord is the true God. He is the living God and the everlasting King. At his wrath, the earth will tremble and the nations will not be able to endure his indignation. Amen. Okay. So here, um, you know, we see that God is to be feared and honored as King. He says, who would not fear you, O King? Right? And also talks about honoring this king. Okay. Now, one of the greatest tributes to God as king came from the mouth of a pagan king, King Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon. Okay. He knew nothing. He was not a Jew. He's not an Israelite. He knew nothing about the God of the heaven and the earth. But when he ascended to great power on this earth, he established the Babylonian Empire, which was so powerful, but something went wrong. What, what, what went wrong in the life of uh, King Nebuchadnezzar? Nobody reads Old Testament. What happened in the life of King? Uh, he made an image of himself of gold, which okay. brought in the destruction. Okay. He lost his mind. Eventually, he became like an animal. He lived in the forest, but uh, uh, we'll come back after the break and see what happens to him. Okay, so we'll, we'll stop here and we'll go for our break. Thank you.